may yahdihi Allahu fala mudilla la wa may yudlil fala hadiya la amma ba'd wa qad qala Allahu ta'ala fi Qur'anil Majid a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim id qala Isa ibn Maryam ya bani Israila inni rasulullahi ilaykum musaddiqan lima bayna yadayya min at-tawrat today many other people from other religions are celebrating the birth of someone who is actually very important to us as Muslims and that is the figure of Isa ibn Maryam or as he is popularly known in English Jesus the son of Mary or Jesus Christ peace be upon him and you know, even though Isa alayhi salam plays a very important role in Islam one of the problems we have today is that we only bring about his name or we only mention his story when we want to do da'wah or we want to get involved in comparative religion. And we reduce his story to simply a issue of who's right and who's wrong in terms of aqidah, which is of course the most important part of the story, but it's not the only aspect to it. Right? It's not just a matter of our aqidah about Isa alayhi salam, but just like the other prophets in the Quran, there are many lessons that we can take from his life and the life of his mother. But because we don't often discuss their life stories from this perspective, it tends to get lost. We tend to forget that the story of Isa alayhi salam, as it is narrated in the Quran and the Sunnah, is not just a story with theological implications, but it is also a story with a lot of moral and spiritual implications. And that's what I want to look at today. Some of the lessons, the spiritual and moral, moral lessons that we can extract from the life of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, and his mother Mary alayhi salam. So, let's begin with Isa alayhi salam. He is in Islam, not just a prophet and a messenger, but from amongst the five greatest messengers. So in Islam, we have different ranks of piety. And even amongst the Anbiya, there are different ranks of piety. And the highest rank of the Anbiya is of course Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And after him, there are four other prophets that rank in at the close second. Those four are Ibrahim alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam, right? So in English, that would be Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. That these are the five greatest prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Isa alayhi salam is not just a minor figure in our history. He's one of the five most important prophets that Allah had sent to this world. From amongst the most influential people in the history of this world. So influential that everybody knows his name. Everybody knows who you are talking about. Regardless of what religion they follow, even if they don't follow any religion at all, if you mention the name Jesus, people know who you are talking about. Now, we know that in Islam, our aqidah about Isa alayhi salam is that he is a prophet of Allah and that he was the second last of the great prophets of Allah, the last one to come before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was the one to whom the Injil, the gospel was sent. But what we tend to not get uh, to focus on is what are his qualities that Allah praised him for? What are his qualities that we are supposed to, to model? supposed to be like. So let's go to some of the great virtues and qualities of Isa alayhi salam. Number one quality of Isa alayhi salam, of Jesus peace be upon him, that stands out to me is his courage, his bravery. How was he brave? Well, if you look at the concept of jihad in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Abdalu jihadin kalimatul haq in the sultan in jayr. The best type of jihad is to speak a word of truth in the face of a tyrant. And this was the life of Isa alayhi salam. This was the life of Jesus, peace be upon him. Speaking truth to tyrants. Whether it was the people who were taking advantage to others through interest-based loans, whether it was the Roman rulers of his time, whether it was the corrupt rabbis of his time, Jesus, peace be upon him, spoke the truth to each of these groups. And he got in trouble for it. And they wanted to kill him for it. And we know another point of difference between Muslims and Christians is that we believe Allah saved him and they believe that he was crucified. But what led up to that? What led up to people wanting to crucify him? It was that he was a man of truth. He was a man 
who spoke the truth no matter what happens to him, what, what the consequences of speaking the truth is. And this is from amongst the greatest types of jihad in Islam. But Isa alayhi salam's jihad is not limited to the jihad of the tongue. Because we believe in a second coming of Jesus, peace be upon him. His first time on earth was a jihad of the tongue. His second time on earth will be a physical jihad against the Dajjal, against the Antichrist. And so he is a role model of both types of jihad. To be brave in what you say and to be brave in physically facing the enemies of Islam as well. And so we learn from the life of Isa alayhi salam, courage. Courage when speaking the truth and courage even when facing your enemies in the battlefield. And so Isa alayhi salam is a role model of courage. A second aspect in which he is a great role model to us is that of zuhad. So Jesus, peace be upon him, is one of the greatest role models of being spiritually detached from this world. And this is his legacy in both Islam and Christianity. That's why even amongst the Christians, when they want to be righteous, they go to a part of, of you know, their version of Zuhad, where they cut themselves off from this world. Why? Because they look at this as the legacy of Jesus, peace be upon him. That he was a man who was cut off from this world, who didn't have his heart attached to this world. So, we see in, in the uh, Israeliyat, the Israeliyat are statements from Jewish and Christian sources that have reached us through the Islamic books. So, in early Islamic history, many rabbis and priests converted to Islam and they brought some of their stories with them and they were passed along and these have been preserved in the books of Islamic history. So, these are a few of these statements taken from uh, Bidaya wa Nihaya by Ibn Kasir where he records some of these Israeliyat. So it is narrated, and by the way, when it comes to Israeliyat, we don't have to believe it, but we don't have to reject it. But when it agrees with our religion, we can take lessons from it, right? So from this Israeliyat, it is narrated that Jesus, peace be upon him, may have said, keep your treasures in the afterlife, because a man's heart is with his treasures, right? Meaning, keep your heart attached to the afterlife, right? Because whatever you, your heart is attached to, that's what you're going to chase after. So if your heart is attached to money, you're going to forget about the Akhirah. If your heart is attached to status and fame, you're going to forget about the Akhirah. But when your heart is attached to Jannah, the Akhirah will always be your number one focus. In another statement that is reported uh, from Jesus, peace be upon him, that he may have said, is that love of this world and love of the afterlife cannot gather together in the heart of a single believer. Like how water and fire cannot gather in the same place. So we know that water extingu uh, extinguishes fire. And water and fire cannot be in the same place, in the same existence, in the same time. Right? You cannot have something that's both water and fire. And so Isa alayhi salam, using this parable, he says that love of this world and love of the akhirah can't be in the same heart at the same time. Meaning you've got to make a choice as to what is your priority. Is your priority this world or the next world? So from these statements we see that Isa alayhi salam was a man of zuhud. He was a man whose life was attached to the akhirah. And Allah blessed him by taking him to the akhirah and keeping him there until his time of returning when he will have to fight the Dajjal. And so we can learn from him you know, in this age of materialism, in this age of consumerism, in this age where it's all about getting more and more and more. We can learn from him that our heart should not be here. There's nothing wrong with halal wealth. There's nothing wrong with owning a lot of wealth. But the heart should be with the akhirah. And the heart should be focused on Jannah. And that is a lesson we learn from the life of Isa alayhi salam. A final beautiful quality we can look at from Isa alayhi salam, from Jesus peace be upon him, is his non-judgmental attitude towards sinners. That he was a man who didn't want to say anything bad about others. And wanted to look for the good in others. And there's the famous story in the Bible, which is also recorded in many of the Muslim books. It has reached us again through the Christian sources. That when there was a woman who was going to be stoned for adultery, Jesus, peace be upon him, said, let the one without sin be the first one to throw a stone. And nobody picked up their hands. Now, one of the Israeliyat, one of the Muslim narrations uh, that have reached us of the story, Allah knows best how authentic it is, states that the people who wanted to stone this woman, 
they were themselves people who were constantly involved in sin. Their lifestyles were sin. But they were men and they were in charge of the community and they could get away with their sins. And they wanted to make an example of this woman so that you know, they could say, oh see, we are applying the punishment. You know, they want to show, show the people we are applying the punishment. Not on themselves, but on someone weaker who can't defend themselves. So the reason why Isa islam stands up for this woman is because this is a matter of injustice. You see, justice in Islam is that the law is applied equally to everyone, not just to the weak people in society. That is injustice. And this is a good example of that. But we also have an, a couple of authentic narrations about Isa alayhi salam related to this topic of not wanting to say bad about others. And these narrations are found in the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So it is reported in the Muwatta of Imam Malik that he relates that Isa alayhi salam once saw a pig walking on the road. And he said, go in peace to the pig. So his disciples asked him, why are you wishing peace upon a pig? And Isa alayhi salam said, so no evil words should ever come off my tongue. I don't want to get accustomed to saying bad words. So from this narration we learn that it was the nature and the habit of Jesus, peace be upon him, that he wouldn't want to utter a single vile word even to an animal. That even when speaking to an animal, an animal that in our religion is considered najis, that is considered haram, that is considered impure, even to such an animal, nothing but kindness comes off our tongues. That is the model of Isa alayhi salam. Another very beautiful narration also found in the Muwatta Imam Malik. Imam Malik narrates that he heard someone say that Isa alayhi salam said to these people, do not look at the faults of others as if you are gods. Look at your own faults as if you are slaves. This is one of the most beautiful narrations in the Muwatta of Imam Malik. That Jesus, peace be upon him, said, do not look at the faults of others as if you are gods. Look at your own faults as if you are slaves. This is one of the biggest problems of our time. That many people want to put themselves on a pedestal. Many people, you know, they go around and say, oh, this person's committing that sin, and that person's committing that sin, and this person's a deviant, and that person's a kafir, and this person's a bidati, and this person's outside the fold of Islam. And they're completely blind to their own spiritual state. They are completely blind to their own sins. They are completely bl- blind to their own weaknesses. The Islamic position that we learn from Isa alayhi salam is to focus primarily on our own hearts. You see someone else do something wrong, oh Allah forgive him. Right? This would be our attitude towards other people. You see somebody else committing a sin, oh Allah forgive him. If you can advise them, advise them. If you know the advice is going to work. If you can't advise them, make dua for them. Oh Allah guide him, oh Allah forgive him. For our own selves, we should be a bit harsher. For our own selves, we should look in the mirror and say, what are my faults? How can I improve my faults? How can I overcome my weaknesses? How can I give up my sins? If we are focused on ourselves, we don't have time to look for faults in others. And so this is another beautiful lesson we learn from the life of Jesus, peace be upon him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us clean hearts and pure tongues and make us from those who are able to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, peace be upon him, and all of the anbiya and all of the siddiqeen and all of the shuhada and all of the salihin. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah, wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da amma ba'd. So, we spoke about Jesus, peace be upon him, and his status in Islam. And it is also important at the same time that we discuss the status of his mother, Maryam bint Imran alayhi salam, Mary, the daughter of Imran and Hanna. May Allah be pleased with all of them. Because this is a great woman in Islam. Right? Mary is not just a great woman in Christianity, but she is a great woman in Islam as well. And from the greatness of Maryam alayhi salam, is that in the Quran, she is the only woman mentioned by name, with an entire surah named after her. And some of the scholars discuss that why aren't other women mentioned by name in the Quran? Because the Quran speaks about the wives of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the mother of Musa alayhi salam, the wives of Musa alayhi salam, the wives of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but none of them are mentioned by name. And one of the opinions, and this is the opinion I believe is strongest, is that the only reason they are not mentioned by name is to give Mary a special status. Allah wanted this to be her special thing. 
that she is the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran. And so therefore the other women are mentioned, but their names are not mentioned, because we know their names through the hadith and through the books of history. But this is her special thing. That she is the only one whose name is mentioned in the Quran. And we have an entire surah, one of the most beautiful and poetic surahs in the Quran, named after Mary, peace, uh, be, uh, peace be upon her. Another great virtue of Maryam alayhi salam in the Quran, we have the story in Surah Ali Imran, where the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Oh Mary, Allah has chosen you over all of the women in this universe. Over all women of all time, you have been chosen to be amongst the greatest of all women. From amongst the virtues of Maryam alayhi salam is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, only four women have ever attained perfection. And by perfection we mean the status just under the Anbiya. Right? So in Islam we believe that the greatest people were the Prophets of Allah. After the Prophets of Allah, the greatest people were those who attained perfection. But very few people attained perfection. Even amongst men, you can't really name that many men who attained perfection who were not prophets. Perhaps Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Who else attains that position? But amongst the women, we know at least four. Right? We know four listed in this hadith. Who are the four women who attained perfection? That is, after the prophets, these are the greatest of people. These four women are Maryam, Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's number one. Number two, the wife of the Pharaoh because she was married to the worst of men and she was still amongst the most righteous of believers. Number three, Khadija, the first Muslim. The first follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khadija. Number four, Fatima, the beloved daughter of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then in the same narration, he mentions that the virtue of Aisha over all women is like the virtue of the best of food over all other food. So some scholars interpret that to mean that although Aisha did not attain perfection, she's next in rank. See that? Siddiqah, right? So after those of perfection comes the Siddiqs and the Siddiqah. So she's on that rank, third, uh, the third level of piety still amongst the most amazing ranks that we should aspire towards. So the point here is, Maryam alayhi salam is listed amongst the greatest women to ever live. Why? What are her qualities? And again, the qualities of Mary, peace be upon her, are not just quality, qualities that women should emulate. They are qualities that every believer should emulate. Right? These are qualities all of us should have. So from amongst the four greatest qual qualities of Mary, peace be upon her, number one, and number two go together, and that is her chastity and her modesty. And these are qualities every believer is supposed to have, not just women, men as well. Now, nowadays we talk a lot about chastity and modesty of women. In our religion, this is for men and for women. And for women because we know that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was a modest man, and we know that Usman anhu, was amongst the most modest of people. And so these are qualities we are all supposed to have. So Mary, peace be upon her, used to live in a small room, when nobody would see her besides the man in charge of her, her uncle the Prophet, Zakaria alayhi salam. Nobody else. She would not interact with non-mahrams at all. And she would dedicate all of her time to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she was someone who would not want to have any kind of relationship with the opposite gender in any way. Now, we are not expected to be at that level. Of course, for us, marriage is a sunnah. And this is something that we should strive towards. But she was of a different level of piety. So at least from her life we learn that in our interactions with people, especially with members of the opposite gender, it should be interactions of modesty and interactions of chastity. That we should be people who are chaste and modest. And we live in an era where these things are dying. These qualities are dying out. They are frowned upon and looked down upon by modern society. We have to revive them again because these are the legacies of the great people who are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the amazing qualities of Maryam alayhi salam is her tawakkul in Allah. The tawakkul of Mary, peace be upon her. And we see this tawakkul in the story of the birth of Jesus, peace be upon him. Because this is a great test from Allah upon Mary. That she was blessed and tested with being pregnant without ever getting married. Through a miraculous pregnancy. Now of course, you know, if, if a woman shows up in society who is supposed to be pious, and she's pregnant and she's not married, everybody, and I mean everybody, is going to assume the worst. It's just human nature. right? That's what we all will do. So this is a test for her. And how did she handle this test? With tawakkul in Allah. With dua, with asking Allah for help, 
We're doing whatever Allah tells it to do. And Allah guides it through this test. Allah helps it through this test. And Allah uses this test to raise her status and to take care of her and to make sure that nobody ever accuses her of evil again. And so he helps her with miracle upon miracle upon miracle. And the final great quality of Maryam is that her du'as were answered. And her tawakkul and her du'as inspired a prophet of Allah to make du'a. So we have this beautiful story in Surah Ali Imran that once when Zakaria alayhi salam went to, to check up on, on, on Mary, he found fruit in her chamber that were out of season. So he asked her, how did you get this? And she said, it's from Allah. He gives whomever he wants, whatever he wants, whenever he wants, right? That he gives whoever he wants without any accounting. The Quran says, right then and there, Zakaria made dua. He made dua, oh Allah grant me a son. And so Allah blessed him with the son Yahya alayhi salam, even though he and his wife were both way past the age of having children. For Allah granted him a miracle. From here we learn multiple lessons. Number one, tawakkul. Number two, miracles can happen. Number three, we see that the du'as of Maryam alayhi salam were answered. Number four, that she was so pious and so righteous that her actions and her words inspired a prophet. It inspired a prophet to take action. That when he saw that this woman who is not a prophet, Allah can give her fruit out of season. That means Allah can give me a child past old age as well. And so we see in this the great model that Mary alayhi salam is to us. So we end this with a reminder to all of us that when it comes to these great figures in our history, don't just look at them as something that we study for comparative religion. Don't just look at them as something we bring up when it's time for da'wah. No, learn their lives, be inspired by their lives, make them our role models and let us try to be like them in whatever way we can. May Allah grant us all righteousness and piety. May He make us from amongst the men and women of chastity and modesty and, and tawakkul and from those who are closest to Him in this world and the next. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen aqimis salah.